Should we, should we, should we rock and roll? Good, mor good morning, everyone. Have you been following the, uh, the adventures of El Chapo down in Mexico? He's the drug leader, uh, drug lord. I, he's got over a billion dollars. And, uh, you know, he's been running drugs and doing all kinds of nefarious things. And uh, uh, he's been accused of murder. Now, we don't really know if he's ever murdered anybody, but uh, he's escaped from the Mexican prison a couple times. And the last, last year, he escaped out of this tunnel. It was a, a, a mile-long tunnel, 30 feet underground, and it was large enough to hold a motorcycle. And they feel that uh, possibly he took the motorcycle out of the prison and drove a mile away to, to escape. And uh, the Mexicans are somewhat embarrassed about it, you know, that uh, they now have him in a maximum security prison, but they've got helicopters flying over the prison at all times and tanks surrounding the prison so that he doesn't escape. Now, the Mexicans are so embarrassed about it, they want the Americans to take, uh, to, to extradite uh, El Chapo to, uh, to America to, to, to spend his time in American prison because they feel the, the Americans have kind of been involved in his drug running exercises and uh, the Americans have profited from it through the financial institution. We don't really know that. We don't really know what's going on. All we know that is uh, here's a criminal that's incorrigible. What do we do with criminals that are incorrigible? Uh, this morning we want to continue our discussion on apologetics. Apologetics meaning coming from the Greek word apologio, meaning to give a reply or an answer. And Peter says in 1 Peter 3 that we always, should always be ready to give a defense for the hope that is within us. So this morning we want to talk about the issue of capital punishment and what we do with incorrigible uh, people. So uh, we're going to take a look at a passage in the book of Genesis. It comes from Genesis chapter 9 and it goes like this. But you must not eat bread that has been... It's life blood still in it, but for the life blood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. Father, we thank you so much for your precious and holy word this morning as we uh, grapple with the issue of... Uh, of a capital punishment, Lord. May we uh, have your wisdom. May we be able to understand what your Holy Spirit would want us to know about this issue. And we pray it in the precious name of the Savior. Amen. Do you remember the passage in John chapter 19? Jesus has been taken prisoner. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's taken prisoner, and he's standing before Pon uh, Pontius Pilate. And the Jews have brought up all kinds of accusations against him. And they beat Jesus, they put, a, they put a, a purple robe upon him, and they put a, a crown of thorns upon his head. Pontius Pilate brings him up before the people and says, what do you want us to do with this man? And they say, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate's going to think to himself, what's this all about? I mean, I don't even understand anything of what's going on. Uh, they claim that he claims to be God. Uh, they said something about him uh, destroying the temple and then in three days. I don't understand any of this. You've got to understand what's going on through the, the, the mind of Pontius Pilate. He doesn't understand the Jewish religion. He doesn't understand what's going on. So he takes Jesus back into the judgment room and he says, Jesus, uh, where are you from? What is this all about? And Jesus says nothing to him. He's silent. And then Pilate looks at him and says, you know, Jesus, I have the authority to crucify you and I have the authority to let you go. To which Jesus says, yeah, I agree. But you wouldn't have that authority if it didn't come from above. Question is, where did Pilate get the authority to crucify Jesus? Well, he got it from this passage back in the book of, back in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 9. Remember the dispensations. We went through dispensationalism last summer, and we talked about the dispensation of innocence, dispensation of con uh, conscience, and we talked about the dispensation of government. And God has given authority to government to rule over the world. Then he goes on to the dispensation of promise, dispensation of law, dispensation of grace. All seem to be dispensations that, 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 are, that are addressed believers. But the dispensation of government has always been there. It seems to continue on through all the other dispensations. It, it's, it's Paul says in Romans chapter 13, the 
are ordained by God. They have God's authority here on earth. And we talked a little bit about that when we talked about the believer's uh, relationship with the government. We have to obey the government because they bring law and order. And what Paul says in Romans chapter 13 is this, that the, the government doesn't bear the sword in vain. And we, and we made, made up the analogy last week. It's like, you know, uh, the government... Uh, it doesn't bear the sword in vain like a detective doesn't bear the sub nose 38 in vain. You know, he's here to keep order, keep us honest, keep us, keep us without committing crimes. But at the heart of that, I believe, is the idea of capital punishment. Romans 13 speaks of the ultimate authority that the government has to take the lives of people that it considers to be a danger to their society. So you see that in, in the book of Romans, but you also see it in the book of Acts. Do you remember the book of Acts? And Paul standing before Festus. Festus is the governor of Judea at this time. And he's got all these, these Jewish people are coming in there. And they're bringing all kinds of accusations against Paul. And Festus says to Paul, you know, how do you answer all this stuff, Paul? These, these people are bringing all kinds of accusations against you. And Paul says, uh, I don't deny that you have the authority to execute me, but I appeal to to Caesar. What he's saying is that, yeah, you have the right, the government has the right to execute me against the government, but I've broken no Roman laws, so I appeal to Caesar. You see what he's arguing is that you have the right to execute me if I've done something wrong, but I appeal to Caesar. So in the New Testament and the Old Testament, capital punishment is dominant. It's just there. Now, when you get into uh, the modern world, a lot of people believe that uh, Jesus annuls uh, the death penalty. And I, one, of my, one of my favorite professors at seminary, there's so many people at Dale Seminary that, that affected my life, that just, just influenced me so much, was one of my professors doesn't believe in the death penalty. And uh, he's one of these guys that if I'm looking at a passage of scripture, I want to see what this guy's got to say. He's, he's, he's a I wouldn't know his name if I said it, but he, he's a low key figure. But he's, he's a brilliant man. He's a great thinker, but he doesn't believe in the death penalty. And the same goes for some friends of mine. We, we started a church years ago called Higher Ground Christian Fellowship. And the, the people in that church were against the death penalty. They didn't believe in the death penalty. And there's a good, and the, the, the reasoning is good. I mean, if you allow a person to live, there's, there's the possibility that he's going to come to Christ sooner or later down the road. And uh, the, the, the best example I have that is David Berkowitz. Do you remember David Berkowitz back in the 70s? He was the son of Sam Killer. I don't think he was a 44 caliber killer or a 45 caliber. I don't know what, I don't know my calibers real well. I don't belong in this church because I don't know my guns well enough like you guys. But, but anyway, he killed six innocent people, injured seven others. He did some horrific things. Now he's uh, up for parole, but he refuses to go up for parole because he says, Jesus has paid for all my sins. He's a Messianic Jew. He's a believer. We're going to be fellowshipping in heaven with David Berkowitz. How awesome is the grace of God? The same thing could be said for a, a Carla Faye Tucker. Do you remember Carla Faye Tucker? She was the girl down in Texas who uh, got high on drugs and she killed someone, so she was uh, going to be executed for her crime. And I remember the, I remember the day the execution. So they had to act. And I remember thinking about her on that day, and there was a tear in my eye thinking about her. But she became a Christian while in prison, and uh, she started a Bible study. And people were coming to know Christ. People, people were studying the Bible in the prison because of this woman. So there's, 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 there's this idea that a lot of Christians have that you just eliminate the death penalty. And they believe that Jesus eliminated the death penalty. And they sometimes they, they look to the scriptures and say, yeah, Jesus eliminated the death penalty. And the passage in, in particular that they will use is John chapter 8. If you remember the passage, uh, the, uh, the Jews bring a woman caught in adultery before Jesus and say to Jesus, this woman was caught in adultery. What say you, Jesus? And Jesus says, who's ever without sin, let them cast the first stone. And then he kneels down and he starts writing in the dirt. Now, we don't know what he's writing in the dirt. Dr. McGee 
uh, says that uh, what he was writing in the dirt was the names of all these people that they had affairs with. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but that, that might be it. Because he stands up and he says, woman, where are your accusers? They've all left. So people look at that and say that uh, uh, Jesus eliminated the death penalty. Uh, probably not. The, the word in, in Greek is, is, is the idea that they came there and they did that to tempt him, to, to try to twist him up and try to get him confused and try to get him to admit something uh, that was contrary to the Jewish law. So, but but that's, that, that's, that's not the point. The point is that they brought in trumped up charges against this woman. It takes two to tango. It takes two to tangle. Where's the man in the situation? He's using this contrived incident against you. So uh, that, that doesn't fly. Also, the idea, too, is that uh, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. To him, he, he, he removed all my sins and left them cl clear as snow. You know, that Jesus paid it all. Therefore, we don't have to, uh, uh, that we don't, we don't need, we need a death penalty. Well, the truth of the matter is, yeah, Jesus paid it all, but you still have to account for your sins, whatever you've done. In the book of Galatians, it says that uh, you reap what you sow. What you've done will, will uh, come back to haunt you. You have to pay for what you've sown. For what you've sown. And uh, one of my issues in life is that uh, we, we, we believe, the Christians got to be careful about this, and I'm going to get this off my chest uh, this morning. Uh, th there's such a thing as cheap grace. It's you, you forgive everybody for everything. You know, my daughter is raped by a man. Uh, it's okay. Forget it. I'm you. Then he rapes my other daughter. Oh, no, no it's, it's fine. I forgive you for that. Then he murders my son. No, I forgive you for that. And then you, 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 he, he, he murders my wife and burns down my house. No, no, I forgive you for that. That's cheap grace. You have to pay for what you've done. And uh, Jesus, you know, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, you know, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They still have to pay for what they've done. What Jesus is saying is don't withdraw your Holy Spirit. Don't, try to, don't stop trying to convert these people to Christ so that they can be saved. But you love your enemies. You love what they've done to you. But they still have to pay the price. You still reap what you sow. So, capital punishment is, uh, is prescribed in the, in the Old Testament. It's prescribed in the New Testament. It isn't nullified by Jesus. The question is, do we have capital punishment or should we have capital punishment now in our society? America is looked at askance by uh, a, lot of, a lot of countries, especially the European countries. They look at America as askance. These Americans are barbaric because they believe in the, in the capital punishment system. And they, they seem to have this value of life. They value life more than Americans do because Americans are barbarians. The question is, is how much is a life worth? What is the value of a human life? I looked it up on the internet. It's worth $160. I mean, you guys don't, didn't realize that maybe, but the, they've, done, they've done an evaluation of all the elements and the, the metals in your body and the, the weight of them and the value on the, on the open market. And they've, they've come up with a, hundred, a figure of $160. Personally, I don't like to brag to anybody, but I think my, my, my body's worth a lot more than that. Uh, if I sold one of my kidneys or my liver, man, I could make a fortune. If I sold my heart to somebody, that would, be, that would, that would make me a lot of money. Uh, of course, I sold my heart out about 30 years ago to a certain woman. So, but, but at any rate, you know, you, 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 you can't put a value on money, and, and, or you can't, you can't put a, 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 a price on your life. We are valuable because we're made in the image of God. Therefore, we are priceless. And these people that, that call us barbarians, they oftentimes have no sense of God. They don't even believe in God. So the value of the human body to them really is 160 bucks because that's all it is. If you don't have a soul, you don't have a spirit within you, that's all your, that's all the, that's all your life is worth. So the book of Leviticus says this, for the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make an atonement for yourselves on the altar. It's the blood that makes atonement for one's life. 
and you know, and, and we're all guilty of this. You know, we all look upon these little sins that we commit. Well, just a little sin here and there. It's not, 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 not nothing really bad. I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't really done something vicious or horrible. But even those small little sins, even those thoughts in our mind that, that, that are contrary to God's will, they have to be paid for. And they were paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. The blood atones for the little sins and it atones for the big sins. What people don't realize is that you and I have infinite value Our, because we have souls. We are made in the image and likeness of God. What the death penalty does is it demonstrates that value to the world. And I understand compassion, but we must demonstrate the value of human life to this world. You take a life, you give up your life. And uh, a lot of people wonder, uh, does, uh, does the death penalty deter crime? And they, it's debated all the time. I really believe that it does. In the book of the Torah, not just Exodus or Numbers, Deuteronomy, but th there's all kinds of uh, reasons that people were put under the death penalty in the Old Testament. For example, those that committed sodomy were to be stoned to death. If you committed adultery, you're to be stoned to death. If you committed kidnapping, you're to be stoned to death. Uh, children, uh, a child cursing his father or his mother is to be stoned to death. The reason that that's put in there because it deters crime. It deters those activities. That's what it says in God's word. It does deter. And so the death penalty does de deter crime too. So, uh, and, and we, we don't think like that in, in this day and age. Uh, one, of, one of the, uh, uh, the President of the United States uh, about a year ago, he said, America is a Christian country. Christian country. Because if you're a Christian country, you've got to go back into the Old Testament, and the Old Testament talks about these laws. You, you, you stone a child because he curses his mother and father. But that's not the issue. I'm a dispensationalist. You know, I, I, I believe that certain God acts in certain ways in certain dispensations and in other ways in dispensations. And God has given us the authority. He's given government the authority to execute according to its laws and its structures. Now, we, don't, we don't stone children to death because of what they've, because of what they've done to their father, what they've said, said to their mother and father. But we can and do execute people who take life. So uh, it, it does, it does, so the Bible teaches that, that, it, that, it, that it does deter, it does deter crime. And you can argue about it all you want, but I'll tell you one thing, it certainly deters the guy that's being executed, he's not going to commit any more crimes. So what the, what the Bible teaches is that uh, death penalty demonstrates the value of life. It, it, it can deter crime, and it's something we need to be very, very careful about how we, 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 we execute it or we, we bring it about. And I think of uh, Anthony Capozzi. Maybe you remember Anthony Capozzi? Remember the, the, bike, the bike path rapist? Uh, he was doing all kinds of horrible things and had seen the bike path rapist. And they went to the police and they, they made a sketch of the bike path rapist and they put it in the newspaper. And somebody sitting in a fast food restaurant, I think it was over on Elmwood Avenue, and they saw Anthony Capozzi coming walking down the street and they said, oh, there he is, there's the bike path rapist, man. And so the police arrested him, put him on trial, found him guilty and put him in, put him, put him in, in, in jail. And uh, thanks to Dennis Delano, our own Dennis Delano and other police working with it, they, 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 they eventually got Anthony Capozzi out of jail. So the, the issue is we've got to be very, very careful about how we, we implement the death penalty. We've got to make sure that we have enough evidence because I, I really have qualms about it myself too, the, the thought of executing somebody that really wasn't guilty. The, uh, the response to that is that we all make mistakes. I mean, when I was a mailman, I would make a mistake. Mr. Marizak probably knows more about that, Steve. You know, my, I often delivered wrong letters into his mailbox. But all he has to do is take the letter out and say, Jim, you made a mistake. You know, we all make mistakes. 
when you make mistakes in that court of law and uh, subject somebody to the death penalty, that's a really important mistake. So you have to be very, very careful. And the Bible has, has, has numerous prescriptions for the death penalty. Uh, they, 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 it has to be at the word of two or three witnesses. They have to be absolutely certain. As a matter of fact, uh, it says in, in, in the Torah that uh, those witnesses are the first ones to cast the stones. That's what Jesus said, who's the first to cast the stone. Uh, there, there's, 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 there's prescriptions for it. You, you have to be careful about what you do. Uh, you, you just, you just can't willy-nilly th throw people in, in the in the gas chamber. So we, we, we need to be very careful about about how we implement it. Uh, you know, in the Bible, John says that uh, Jesus is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. He's full of grace and he's full of truth. He's got that perfect balance between truth and grace. You and I are kind of bouncing off the walls. You know, one, one day I'm for truth, the other day I'm for grace. But Jesus has that.